As a scientist, I'm often asked, what is a comet? What's the point in studying them? The simplest way to think of a comet is analogous to an asteroid. Asteroids and comets are the rubble, the building blocks left over from the formation of the solar system, which, due to interactions with the giant planets, were unable to form the planets in their own right. The main difference between the asteroids and the comets is their composition, and this is driven by their, their location, their distance from the Sun. The asteroids spend all of their lives near the Sun, within the orbit of Jupiter. As such, they're composed of silicate rocks and metals, things you'd expect to see where the temperatures are high. Conversely, on the other hand, comets spend almost all of their lives a long way from the Sun, where temperatures are cold. As such, they contain ices. Voila. There are two main reservoirs of bodies which can become the comets orbiting the Sun. The first and largest of these reservoirs is the Oort cloud, a spherical cloud of bodies orbiting the Sun many hundreds of billions of kilometers away. These bodies orbit the Sun every few million years on orbits which can loop almost as far as half the distance to the nearest star. The second reservoir is the Kuiper belt, which is a, a belt of bodies orbiting on a fairly low inclination just outside the orbit of Neptune. So these bodies typically orbit around 5 billion kilometers from the Sun. Every now and then, one of either of these populations of bodies will be kicked inwards towards the Sun onto long, looping elliptical orbits. A long way from the Sun, we see a bare nucleus, almost like an asteroid in space, a point source. As we approach the Sun, ices on the surface start to sublime. They turn straight from solid to gas. In doing so, they form the coma of the comet, a transitory atmosphere, a cloud around the nucleus. The nucleus here is a few kilometers wide. The coma may be many hundreds of thousands or maybe a million kilometers across. As the body approaches the sun, this coma is impacted by the solar wind and the solar radiation pressure, which forms the tail, which we associate with comets. The tail typically points away from the sun as the comet orbits. If we are lucky, we may have a great comet, a comet which is very large, many tens of kilometers across the nucleus, or which approaches the sun very close. In this case, we have two tails. We have, on this image, the blue iron tail, which points directly away from the sun, and the silver dust tail. The dust lags behind slightly as the comet orbits. The unique thing about comets is not just that they're the building blocks of the solar system. Their life history means that they are pristine. They are the ideal, ideal material to go and study if you want to look at the origins of the solar system and possibly even of life itself. As such, as a scientist, I really cannot wait to get to the comet to, to land, to sniff, to analyze, to see what these things are made of. There have, of course, been missions to comets before now. These missions have, however, all interacted with the comets at very high speed. They've flown past at many kilometers per second, or indeed impacted with the comet in the case of deep impact. Following the success of Giotto in 1986, however, the Europeans decided to do something a bit different. 
they decided to have a long duration encounter with the comet. They decided to build a space mission to enter orbit around the nucleus of a comet and to deposit a lander onto the surface. After many iterations, this mission became Rosetta. Rosetta is quite a complex mission. It comprises an orbiting spacecraft. This spacecraft will orbit the nucleus of a comet, producing a, a global map, doing some really, really cool science, trying to work out what the comet's made of from orbit. After six months, Rosetta will deposit a lander named Philae onto the surface. Philae will separate from the orbiter, will deploy a series of intricate landing legs, which will allow it to, to dock with the surface of the chosen comet. The comet chosen was churimov gerasimenko a comet discovered by a pair of Ukrainians back in 1969. It orbits between the orbit of Jupiter and the orbit of Mars. The, the nucleus is roughly four kilometers across. Uh, we cannot say precisely what shape this is, but the small size means it cannot form a sphere and its own gravity, so it's likely to be roughly potato-shaped. This here is a, a simplified Lego model representation of the lander, Philae, which we will use to demonstrate some aspects of the mission. Fixation is a very important issue on the comet surface as there is low gravity. As soon as two legs have contact to the comet surface, a harpoon gets shot, which you can see over here. This harpoon is taking a small wire with it, and as soon as the anchoring tip is fixed in the comet surface, the wire gets rewinded and the lander rests perfectly on the comet surface. In addition to this fixation, in the foot itself, there is a so-called eye screw, which uses the landing energy to screw into the surface and therefore is an additional fixation. On top of that, as all these means are not working at all, we can use our so-called code gas system, which is a kind of hold down thrust, means there is a thruster which can blow out a force to keep the lander on the comet surface until the damping mechanism of the landing gear is able to get quit of the descent velocity. The landing gear has a few more functionalities. There is a rotation mechanism. The overall body can be rotated around its axis to make measurements on different surface spots. It can lower and lift the complete lander down to the comet surface, and it can tilt as well the body of the lander so that the, the bottom plate of the lander is nicely parallel to the comet surface. The goal of Rosetta is the global characterization of comet churyumov gerasimenko To do this, before we take too many measurements, we need to know the context of these measurements as they appear on the comet. For this reason, we have ROLIS, a downward-facing camera on the base of the lander, which takes effectively a series of aerial photographs throughout the descent, so we know what the landing site looks like and its context in terms of the general comet. Once we're on the surface, we have a series of cameras named Shiva located around the upper surface of the lander. See the five cameras there, and also a pair of Shiva cameras on the rear face just here, which can let us have a, a stereo pair image, so we can take 3D images of the comet surface in front of us. This lets us gauge the distance to objects in the field of view. Other spacecraft have imaged comets before, of course. Rosetta is different. The lander will get down and get dirty. It will get its hands dirty. It will interact with the surface of the comet. To do this, we have the drill, just here, which can penetrate up to 20 centimetres into the surface and return samples. These samples can be imaged by a microscope in both visual and infrared light, this is another part of the, the Shiva instrument. After imaging, the materials can be burnt, can be combusted or pyrolyzed. The vapors from this can be passed into a pair of mass spectrometers for analysis. The first of these mass spectrometers is COSAC, 
which is geared more towards looking at the high mass compounds, the long chain organics, the hydrocarbons, the things which could possibly conceivably form life sometime in the future. As well as COSAC, there is Ptolemy, which is geared more towards the, the light compounds, the volatiles, the ices. So we're looking at water ice, we're looking at carbon dioxide ice. As well as the drill, we can interact with APXS. This is an alpha particle and X-ray spectrometer. With this instrument, we will bombard the surface of the nucleus with alpha particles and X-rays. We then look at the backscattered radiation to analyse the chemical composition of the surface. We can also take the temperature of the surface using this instrument just here, which is the Mupus penetrometer. This penetrates into the surface, hammers itself in, is then released, allowing the lander to continue moving. Whilst this instrument takes a, a profile through the surface of the temperature and the thermal properties, there's a thermal imager located on the upper surface of the lander just here, which takes a, a context image. It measures the, the infrared thermal temperature of the area in front of the lander. Comets are active bodies. They're surrounded by plasma, and this plasma can carry a magnetic field. So we have Romap located just here. We can also measure the interior of the comet, by this time in the deep interior, using an interaction between the lander and the orbiter. We have two antennae located here and here on the lander. These can communicate in a ping-pong fashion with the orbiter. Looking at differences in the signal as they pass from the lander through the comet to the water on the far side, let's just measure the internal structure to look for voids, to look for strata, to get an idea of what the comet's like on the inside, deep in the interior. Other interactions that take place are with the Casse experiment on the feet, which is part of the Sesame experiment. This instrument works in two main ways. It can communicate between the feet, so one feet will transmit a signal to be detected by the other feet. This lets us calculate and to understand the, the structure between the feet of the very near surface. Sesame can also look at, with Casse, the deep interior of the comet by listening passively to, to comet quakes, listening for activity within the comet, say, gas being produced. As well as Casse, Sesame also includes the dust impact monitor located on the upper surface of the lander just here. As the name suggests, this monitors dust impacts. It's listening and feeling for dust particles being ejected from the comet nucleus and then falling back in to impact the sensor to be detected. To perform all these science activities, the lander has to carry a few other systems as well, such as a central computer. The computer will coordinate in between the units. Then, in addition, there is a data storage. So all experiments which have been carried out store first the data in the data storage, and then the data get transferred from the lander with this small antenna system, which you can see over here, to the orbiter. We're starting our mission at a distance to the sun of 415 million kilometers. Means we need a good power system, which is divided into solar cells and batteries. The primary battery system is supporting the first science sequence and allowed each unit at least to get executed once. The secondary battery is then for the further mission and get charged via the solar cells. On the comet surface, the balcony sees a temperature of minus 160 degrees. This is not suitable to switch on any electronic inside the lander itself. Therefore, there is a power system and a thermal system which uh, uses heaters to heat up the electronic units, but this is not sufficient. In the beginning, we do need something on top of that, which are these two absorbers. The absorbers are a special coated plates which are catching all the sun so the heat inside the lander to the electronic unit, and this is sufficient to switch them on. What you see over here, this is the so-called cold structure, and all electronic is sitting on a so-called warm structure, which is totally isolated from the cold structure. In between, there are two thermal tents, which supporting as well the thermal environment inside the lander. All of this information together will tell us the, the life history of the comet. It will let us characterize the entire nucleus, surface, subsurface, and coma. 
With this information, we can answer lots of questions around the origins of the solar system. The origins of, say, water in the Earth's oceans, and possibly the origins of life on Earth. There's a lot of information to be got from this small spacecraft.